Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton. Chapter 1 The village lay under two feet of snow with drifts at the windy corners. In a sky of iron, the points of the dipper hung like icicles and Orion flashed his cold fires. The moon had set, but the night was so transparent that the white house fronts between the elms looked gray against the snow. Clumps of bushes made black stains on it, and the basement windows of the church sent shafts of yellow light far across the endless undulations. Young Ethan Frome walked at a quick pace along the deserted street, past the bank and Michael Eady's new brick store, and Lawyer Vernum's house with the two black Norway spruces at the gate. Opposite the Varnum gate, where the road fell away toward the Corbury Valley, the church reared its slim, white steeple and narrow peristyle. As the young man walked toward it, the upper windows drew a black arcade along the side wall of the building, but from the lower openings on the side where the ground sloped steeply down to the Corbury Road, the light shot its long bars, illuminating many fresh furrows in the track leading to the basement door and showing, under an adjoining shed, a line of sleighs with heavily blanketed horses. The night was perfectly still, and the air so dry and pure that it gave little sensation of cold. The effect produced on, fr on Frome was rather of a complete absence of atmosphere, as though nothing less tenuous than ether intervened between the white earth under his feet and the metallic dome overhead. It's like being in an exhausted receiver, he thought. Four or five years earlier, he had taken a year's course at a technical college at Worcester and dabbled in the laboratory with a friendly professor of physics, and the images supplied by that experience still cropped up at unexpected moments through the total different associations of thought in which he had since been living. His father's death and the misfortunes following it had put a premature end to Ethan's studies. But though they had not gone far enough to be of much practical use, they had, fed, they had fed his fancy and made him aware of huge cloudy meanings behind the daily face of things. As he strode along through the snow, the sense of such meanings glowed in his brain and mingled with the bodily flush produced by his sharp stamp. At the end of the village, he paused before the darkened front of the church. He stood there a moment, breathing quickly, and looking up and down the street in which not another figure moved. The pitch of Corbury Road, below Lawyer Varnum Spruces, was the favorite coasting ground of Starkfield, and on clear evenings the church corner rang till late with the shouts of the coasters. But tonight not a sled darkened the whiteness of the long declivity. The hush of midnight lay on the village, and all its waking life was gathered behind the church windows, from which strains of dance music flowed with the broad bands of yellow light. The young man, skirting the side of the building, went down the slope toward the basement door. To keep out of range of the revealing rays from within, he made a circuit through the untrodden snow and gradually approached the farther angle of the basement wall. Thence, still hugging the shadow, he edged his way cautiously forward to the nearest window, holding back his straight spare body and craning his neck till he got a glimpse of the room. Seen thus, from the pure and frosty darkness in which he stood, it seemed to be seething in a mist of heat. The metal reflectors of the gas jets sent crude waves of light against the whitewashed walls, and the iron flanks of the stove at the end of the hall looked as though they were heaving with volcanic fires. The floor was thronged with girls and young men. Down the side wall facing the window stood a row of kitchen chairs from which the older women had just risen. By this time, the music had stopped, and the musicians, a fiddler, and the young lady who played the harmonium on Sundays were hastily refreshing themselves at one corner of the supper table, which aligned its devastated pie dishes and ice cream saucers on the platform at the end of the hall. The guests were preparing to leave, and the tide had already set toward the passage where coats and wraps were hung, when a young man with a sprightly foot and a shock of black hair shot into the middle of the floor and clapped his hands. The signal took instant effect. The musicians hurried to their instruments. The dancers, some already half-muffled for departure, 
fell into line down each side of the room. The older spectators slipped back to their chairs, and the lively young man, after diving about here and there in the throng, drew forth a girl who had already wound a cherry-colored fascinator about her head, and leading her up to the end of the floor, whirled her down its length to the bounding tune of a Virginia reel. Throne's heart was beating fast. He had been straining for a glimpse of the dark head under the cherry-colored scarf, and it vexed him that another eye should have been quicker than his. The leader of the reel, who looked as if he had Irish blood in his veins, danced well, and his partner caught his fire. As she passed down the line, her light figure swimming, swinging from hand to hand in circles of increasing swiftness, the scarf flew off her head and stood out behind her shoulders, and Frome, at each turn, caught sight of her laughing, panting lips, the cloud of dark hair about her forehead, and the dark eyes which seemed the only fixed points in a maze of flying lines. The dancers were going faster and faster, and the musicians, to keep up with them, belabored their instruments like jockeys lashing their mounts on the home stretch. Yet it seemed to the young man at the window that the reel would never end. Now and then he turned his eyes from the girl's face to that of her partner, which in the exhilaration of the dance, had taken on a look of almost impudent ownership. Dennis Eady was the son of Michael Eady, the ambitious Irish grocer, whose suppleness and effrontery had given Starkfield its first notion of smart business methods, and whose brick store testified to the success of the attempt. His son seemed likely to follow in his steps, and was, meanwhile, applying the same arts to the conquest of the Starkfield maidenhood. Hitherto, Ethan Frome had been content to think him a mean fellow, but now he positively invited a horsewhipping. It was strange that the girl did not seem aware of it, that she could lift her rapt face to her dancers and drop her hands into his without appearing to feel the offense of his look and touch. Frome was in the habit of walking into Starkfield to fetch home his wife's cousin, Maddie Silver, on the rare evenings when some chance of amusement drew her to the village. It was his wife who had suggested, when the girl came to live with them, that such opportunities should be put in her way. Maddie Silver came from Stamford, and when she entered the Frome's household to act as her cousin Zena's aide, it was thought best, as she came without pay, not to let her feel too sharp a contrast between the life she had left and the isolation of a Starkfield farm. But for this, as Frome sardonically reflected, it would hardly have occurred to Zena to take any thought for the girl's amusement. When his wife first proposed that they should give Maddie an occasional evening out, he yet inwardly demurred at having to do the extra two miles to the village and back after his hard day on the farm. But not long afterward, he had reached the point of wishing that Starkfield might give all its nights, its nights to revelry. Maddie Silver had lived under his roof for a year, and from early morning till they met at supper, he had frequent chances of seeing her. But no moments in her company were comparable to those when, her arm in his, and her light step flying to keep time with his long stride, they walked back through the night to the farm. He had taken the girl from the first day when he had driven over the flats to meet her, and she had smiled and waved to him from the train, crying out, You must be Ethan! as she jumped down with her bundles, while he reflected, looking over her slight person. She don't look much on housework, but she ain't a fretter anyhow. But it was not only that the coming to his house of a bit of hopeful young life was like the lightning of a fire on a cold hearth. The girl was more than the bright, serviceable creature he had thought her. She had an eye to see and an ear to hear. He could show her things and tell her things and taste the bliss of feeling that all he imparted left long reverberations and echoes he could wake at will. It was during their night walks back to the farm that he felt most intensely the sweetness of this communion. He had always been more sensitive than the people about him to the appeal of natural beauty. His unfair.